is telling his fiance Kay uh, about uh, the bat, the um, musician, sorry, the the superstar Johnny Fontaine, and uh, how his father Don Corleone managed to get Johnny Fontaine out of his uh, contract with a band. Um, and we hear the term, he made him an offer he couldn't refuse for the first time. Uh, so, so, and in that title is the, the kind of denial by Michael that this is the background to, that he's from, that somehow he can escape this honor and shame system um, and, and the, the ethical code that he's grown up with. And through the rest of the movie, of course, we find out that Michael has anything but managed to escape um, the honor and shame morality system, the ethical guidelines by which he has grown up. Um, and uh, I, and the, the very in the very first scene of The Godfather, uh, we have the image of Bonacera, the undertaker asking Don Corleone for a favor. Um, he says, I believe in America, but then goes on to explain that America has let him down, that America has failed um, to provide justice to his daughter who has been injured by two men. Um, and when he took them to court, or when his daughter took them to court, they uh, were given a suspended sentence. And Buenos Aires believes he should they should be killed. He asks Don Corleone to kill them. And Don Corleone says, no, that, that's not justice. They didn't kill your daughter. Uh, so there, immediately there's a kind of insight, um, insight into the idea that even in an honor and shame system, um, in a, a system with outside judicial, the judicial system, there is the idea of uh, proportionality that uh, justice is proportional, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, not an eye for a life. So, uh, so there, that we, I, I'm hope, I've reminded you there what an honor and shame system is by reminding you of the Godfather. And uh, to bring it into the real world, um, I thought I'd share a memory with you that actually only came to me this morning. Um, about, well, between 2002 and 2007, I lived in a former mining village in Yorkshire, in the, in the uh, area between Wakefield and Barnsley, which is completely full of mining villages. Uh, and there's no big towns really, they're very, very small communities now since the pit closures in the 1980s. Um, and I was living, I, we lived in, uh, on a corner plot in, an old, in a former colliery house. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd chosen it like a, like a good anthropologist. I thought it would be the perfect house because it was on a court in the corner. We had a large front garden. We didn't have much of a back garden because it had an old wash house in it where the laundry and um, people would shower or wash on their return from the pit. And, but it meant that we would lit, we would spend time outside in the front garden as a part of the community and I could get to know people and talk to people. Anyway, one night uh, I heard an explosion and I jumped out of bed and in the house opposite, uh, their pretty much brand new car, it was a little car, it was, a, I think it was a little green metallic, possibly a Citroen, a, 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 a little, family car had burst into flames. It had exploded in quite an unusual way. And I was quite shocked. Um, the uh, fire brigade did arrive eventually, uh, but by that time the car was completely burnt out and there'd been quite a lot of damage to the front of the house. Now in my corner plot in the front garden over the next few days and weeks, um, my husband Dave and I were told bits of information about this explosion and why it had happened. And it transpired 
the, the reason, well, the, the immediate reason it had happened was because the, the, one of the sons in the family who was learning disabled, um, was a very friendly young man. He spent quite a lot of time chatting to me when I was in the garden, had actually been exposing himself in the park uh, to girls, to young girls. And, uh, and this was meant as, as, as some kind of revenge, I suppose, but for that act. Um, which the community felt wouldn't be dealt with properly or hadn't been dealt with previously by the police or social services. And also I learned quite a lot about this man's history that, um, I mean, all sorts of incredibly private details about um, his cl claim for sickness, his, um, the early pension he'd claimed from the coal board, his early retirement, all of which people felt that he hadn't been telling the truth, that he'd been swinging the leg, that, he, that he'd uh, been asking for compensation that he wasn't deserving of. So uh, on reflection, what we have here is a really clear, um, clear example of the honor and shame morality system at work. And, um, it fits quite neatly into quite into the points that Jonathan Haight makes that we've what we've got is uh, a young man that's not care or a family that doesn't appear to be caring for its community. This man, young man, has caused harm to some young girls in the, the park. Um, th th this man has been cheating the system. He hasn't been fair. Um, he's somehow betrayed the community. He hasn't actually been behaving like a man as the community understands. He hasn't been working hard. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't uh, claimed what he's entitled to. He has gone beyond that. He's lied. Um, and and obviously there's a sense in that this young man's behavior, although he didn't really understand, I suggest because of his learning disability, what he was doing, he had obviously degraded these girls. He had crossed a kind of sanctity measure. He, his, um, his behavior was inappropriate and had threatened the purity of the girls in question. Um, and, so what had been dispensed to this family was thought to be proportional. Um, it didn't matter that this man, the young man was, didn't really understand his intentions. A, a crime had been committed or a crime, a harm to the community had committed and there had to be some, some justice for that. So justice had to come from somewhere. And this they, people generally felt was a good, good form of justice. Um, and calling the authorities was definitely outside. It was a last resort um, within this system. You didn't involve the police. In fact, the police didn't come onto the estate unless they were specifically invited they were kind of, they knew, and, and definitely in the Wakefield area in general, that, that it would be very provocative for the police to appear on the street, the, the, on the estate just as a form of supervision, that they, that they needed to be expressly invited. Um, and, and it was quite, it's in contrast, it's still an honour and shame system, but it's, but it it is very much an egalitarian system. It, there wasn't a Don Corleone. It wasn't. And also within this system, men and women had incredibly clear gender roles, but they weren't, it wasn't a kind, it wasn't a patriarchy in the sense you'd understand the, uh, as you would understand from the Sicilian mafia context. 
Um, and there, were, there is a suggestion within this that the, the wife, that not the family, sorry, the family who was being held responsible for their son's action, it was definitely the man that was being punished, but the woman was being punished as well because she hadn't managed to control her man or her men. And this system I very, very much recognized from my own upbringing. The village that we lived in was next door. It was the next village along to the village my mother grew up in. So it was a system that I recognized. And she still says to this day, if my husband does something I don't like, well, you know, why don't you just tell him? Why don't you just tell him? You know, as if my, my word is, should be the ultimate moral authority within the household. Um, and the, uh, there's a, I mean, by extension, the, uh, the place where my grandmother was born uh, was nearer to Barnsley, but nearer between, in this same hinterland between Barnsley and Wakefield, but nearer to Barnsley in Wursborough Dale. And that former mining village now, very much of mining village then, uh, in uh, 1911 when she was born. And it was a, a set of 50 uh, for 54 back-to-back -back houses. And uh, with, it was quite insanitary uh, because they didn't have indoor plumbing. Um, and so they were eventually they were knocked down in the early 1960s with my great grandmother being the last person to leave. She refused to leave until she was removed by the, uh, by the authorities. Um, but in this system, it was called Jarrett's Buildings, and uh, and there's a historian, another woman like me, who <laughs> is incredibly interested in this set of 54 houses because she has relatives from there as well. And uh, she's done rather more work on it than me, but together we have built up quite an interesting picture of life in Jarrett's Buildings during the 150 years that were there. And there's a lot of uh, uh, press coverage. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, newspaper reports that go back of the residents during that time. And what's very, very interesting is there's a lot of um, violence, a lot of criminal violence brought to court, dealt with by a magistrate. Um, and often that violence is between women. And it, it's certainly not all men. Um, and there's a rather interesting case of uh, one of my grandmother's neighbours um, where she, she was brought to court for hitting a man around the head with a poker. And the reason she had done this, it transpires, is he had, he had, a, had a problem with her. She'd offered some insult to his son earlier in the day and he'd gone round, he'd entered the house she, he'd sat on a chair and told her he was the best looking Irishman around, obviously propositioning her. Now, apparently there were other men in the, the house at that time that she could have called on to defend her honor, but she chose not to take that course. Instead, she picked up a poker and she hit him around the head as her own way of, of um, defending her honor. And, uh, and in fact, the magistrate seemed to understand this. And he said she would clearly been severely provoked, but he offered her a fine anyway. And the man did survive. I mean, it wasn't a serious injury. Um, so, yeah, so this is a community in which, which is, again, it's quite, it seems quite egalitarian in terms of, uh, it, it, although the, the roles between men and, men and women are quite, clearly defined that the, the men obviously go to the pit, they have their, um, put their own set of uh, networks and political systems, so do the women. They, uh, the, the system is very, very much a local. The women tend to obviously live in the houses all their lives and they might have a series of husbands during that time um, as, as uh, alliance, as when one, you know, their first husband or second husband dies, they will take a new husband who needs obviously the support of a woman to look after his children and so that he is housed as well. Um, and uh, 
what's really interesting, what the Denise, the historian Denise uh, Bates found out about uh, this group of houses um, was that in, compared with the surrounding area, there were very, very few incidents of um, child cruelty. The parents weren't brought to court for their children being malnourished or for mistreating their children. And her suggestion is because the kinship network in this group of 54 houses, the way it was socially organized, the way it was it policed as a community was actually so effective that children were very, very well looked after within that system. So yeah, it, it's, um, I hope what I'm trying to do by telling you these stories is to, is to suggest to you that you might have examples from your own experience where um, to draw on, where perhaps we, the sort of old fashioned or contemporary honor and shame systems kind of bubble up, how communities handle their own justice, where they feel it's actually better to handle things themselves. And of course the question is, who, what kind of man would best lead this kind of community? Who would they elect as a political leader? Well, in this case, the son of Wordsbridale, in fact, descended from other residents of Jarrett's buildings. Uh, the, in fact, the son of my grandmother's cousin was Arthur Scargill. So if you think of Arthur Scargill, he was red haired, fiery, very um, famous for a certain stance and way of speaking uh, very, very passionately. Um, uh, always speaking to protect the community of mine workers. Uh, but he divided the nation very, very much in a, in, quite in a way reminiscent of Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I mean, of course, I started on this journey of exploration of honour and shame uh, with, uh, with the ethnography by Murovich, Mur Mur I think her name is, and, uh, and Shields, who did an ethnography of, I suppose, comparable areas to this in America formal industrial areas with very, very strong honor and shame tradition, um, a strong history of pa patronage um, and a, uh, she, the, the ethnography is called Trump's Democrats. So this, this, these were areas that voted for Trump in every previous election. They voted for Obama twice, but somehow in Trump, they saw they saw a patron, they saw someone that would protect their communities, um, someone that they recognized as a man from an honor and shame system, as someone that would look out for them and their communities, make their communities great again. Um, which obviously the rest of the world is looking in confusion. Why on earth have you chosen this man to be your leader? Um, yeah, so, uh, I haven't come on to, I, have, I perhaps haven't got time to talk about the internet and the shaming on the internet. John Ronson's written two brilliant books about that. Um, and uh, and I, I've linked you to ContraPoints' really interesting visual essay on the, on the public shaming of, um, of JK Rowling. And, and she explains very clearly why that shaming happened why that shaming happened um and the, and the, because the community um of trans people trans activists do not feel represented or feel threatened they they've adopted their own way of um bringing someone to justice um so yeah that's i think i hope that's enough of a stimulus talk to get you thinking <laughs> about how the honour and shame systems perhaps coexist with our uh, traditional systems and also to recognise them within us. Um, 
in, in, you know, like Michael, this is my, as he says, it is my family, Kay, not me. Perhaps we all rec need to recognise to some extent that it is us. And, and what that can do for us. Are there things, is, is there, you know, things like restorative justice? Um, uh, asking uh, um, families for their input on sentencing. Is there ways in which those old, those old fashioned honor systems where family and community are central at, at offer us something? Okay, that's it. I think that's probably all I've got time for, isn't it? <laughs> well, the, the time is a bit flexible here, yeah, but could I just ask you, to, could you say a little bit to link this into the middle way, which is our, our theme? Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so really, it, it comes from my, the initial title, really, of the talk. Um, it is my family, K, not me. So it, there is a sense in which, um, yeah, so we could look at it as this kind of behaviour, the violence, taking things into your own hands, uh, the avoiding of kind of, what, what would you call it, kind of the contemporary justice system. Um, could, could, in a sense, could be seen as a Jungian type shadow, something that we deny about ourselves. And, and obviously in some communities, it's very, very in the open, it's ever present. And what I'm asking is, is, you know, do we actually, what harm do we do when we're denying that this, is, this too is a part of our knowledge, a part of the legacy that we've grown up with to some extent? Um, obviously, that it, it comes through in Greek philosophy <laughs> or Greek um, stories that the, the uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm sure you could think of a lot of examples of that. Uh, in fact, Twitter, <laughs> I often think to, is a bit like a Greek chorus. It, it kind of creates a drama. It tells everyone what, how, what, how they should be responding. Um, uh, so yes, it's yeah, it's um, so yes, and so that it's that kind of middle way recognition of of I suppose quite ancient systems that we've been brought up within, which we might be in denial of, and what can we get from them? I think in my kind of talking about Jarrett's buildings, is is there a you know what can what might be we, the values of this be? as well is there a way in which um having um sort of embracing the values of community and family and taking responsibility for ourselves rather than kind of um giving it to greater authorities i think that's all about <laughs> what the middle way of that is about in a way isn't it we're not appealing to a higher authority we're taking responsibility for ourselves and and of course you know it can end very very badly as it does in the godfather so so obviously this needs to be incremental and how do we negotiate that yeah. great okay well i mean that that fits in perhaps um some time ago in the previous series, I was talking about responsibility and the idea of ethics of stretch. So this is one of our starting points, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds very much as though um, the fixed gender roles are part of that. Yeah, that, 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 that's one of our starting points and we learn how to stretch our gender roles. Is, is that how you generally approach yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of contemporary anthropologists point out that, um, you know, that, that these honest systems do kind of exist so so in a traditional society you you may the woman may both you know be responsible for the household and um behaving in a kind of traditional uh, mother type way but also she goes out to work and she operates within a completely different liberal western system as well um and and obviously that that could include things like modest dress wearing a veil um, but it doesn't mean that she's not a fully modern woman as well. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's place open for questions then. Anybody ask anything? Yeah, yeah I've got a question, Nina. Um, you know, I've, um, with my limited knowledge of this, I've, I've understood that the, the, the 
Um, shame honor systems are you know, specifically prevalent in hunter gathering communities, but also also very much in traditional uh, cultures. Um, and but, but my understanding is that we are system or a guilt based system. Have I understood that correctly? And, and if that's the case, I, I've not really understood how how do we how does our system differ from the the, the shame um, on a system? Okay, so we, we sometimes we talk about um, a kind of dignity guilt system. Okay, and I um, and I think that that is very much um, uh, you know that seems to be more for, it, for me far more into a kind of liberal Western system where and, and quite a middle class system as well. <laughs> so um, and I would draw a distinction between myself. Um, and it's the thing I've recognised in myself, in, in, I suppose, in terms of embracing my chateau, is that I'm not terribly dignified. I don't rise above things. I will get into a scrap with people. Whereas, and I see my friends who are much more middle class than my, me, seem to have a much more measured approach in, in terms of, you know, of, say, of being rising above it, being dignified. Um, and and I think, you know, and, and the difference between Obama and his kind of the dignity he displayed and Trump is quite a good example of that. So what I'm saying is both those systems exist, coexist. And working class communities in this country, I would say, are very, very much um, what we would say were honour and shame societies. Uh, the um, agricultural communities uh, not so much, tend to be um, honour and shame societies as well. And, um, and also it seems to bubble up wherever people don't feel that they feel marginalised, that they're, the power, that the justice isn't there for them, I suppose. By the way, just as an aside, I actually interviewed for the Middle Way Society podcast, John Ronson on shame, on, uh, on his book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, if anyone's interested. Enjoy, how did you? Great, it's a fantastic book. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Great, just, just going back to that point, the Perry base, Nina, um, would the difference also be something to do with individuality? You know, that, that the shame on a culture doesn't really recognise individuality in its development. Absolutely, yes, it is. It's about yeah, it's about kind of community. Yeah, it's about community and family. So it's where you fit in much more than your rights as an individual. Yeah. So that that you know your ability to go out into the world and create a life to yourself, for yourself, may under some circumstances be incredibly limited if you are fully within that system. In, in other systems, it might not be, you know, you, you, depending on the fam your family circumstances, it may be encouraged that you go out <laughs> and get a job and, and, and realize all sorts of ambitions. But, but that's quite often based within the idea that you're doing that for the family, for family prestige and honor. Um, and, you know, a lot of my Asian friends would say, you know, when, when they were growing up, they, they only had two choices, really. They became a lawyer or they became a doctor or they became a dishonor to their family. So that's three choices. <laughs> and it's a joke, but I think it's a joke that illustrates something quite well. Yeah. It might be slightly different in the U.S. because... Uh... It is very individual. I mean, in that film, Taxi Driver, the main character looking in the mirror, you looking at me, you know, it's that that scene. Yeah. And um, the example that one of the authors, I think of one of the books you were talking about, um, gave when he first recognized this honor way of being as his friend was driving when he was a teenager and he was driving out of control and he kept saying, slow down, slow down. And, and his friend would not slow down. And um, they had a real fight about it because he just kept screaming, slow down, because he thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And his friend wouldn't talk to him after that because his honor had been 
um, insulted by him telling him to slow down. Very individual. Those mm -hmm. two examples. Uh, and the other thing is in, in, in the US, it's mostly in the South, the honor system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, not in the North. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, it's, um, and I think that's really well documented, isn't it? I think that there was a, uh, which I can't remember the author, there's an author that's, uh, Tamla Summers has written a book called Why On The Matters. And then that, he gives a really good example of where they did this, some social research where they, um, they sent CVs to employers in the North and South. And in the CV, the, um, or, the, uh, uh, or the job application, the um, applicant said, look, I've made this terrible mistake when I was young. I got into a brawl in a, in a bar. I was insulted. The fight went too far and I, under, I ended up killing this man. Um, was, I've served my time. I hope that you'll look, you know, in the South, this was seen as completely understandable, whereas employers in the North didn't see this under, as understandable in any way at all and didn't reply. So, and so that's quite a good, <laughs> good way, example of how that plays out. Yeah. In, in general, isn't there a strong association of violence with the, the honor shame culture? Or is that a prejudice? Or am I? that's my, no, I, my sense of it there is definitely because the, the justice is being is seen as a is as personal responsibility right yeah so yeah. it's that you, kind of stand up for yourself stick up for yourself yeah sort your problems out yourself yeah mm. but i suppose my but can't can't you as an individual also address injustice in other perhaps more um, integrative ways than violence. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'm sure you can. But I guess within an honour and shame system, you're also, you're sending a message out to the wider community as well. So if you take the example of that woman standing up and hitting a man around the head with a poker, yeah. The message she's sending out is that you don't mess with me. You don't come into my house and proposition me. You don't dishonor me. And that, that example will be carried out into the community. That she's a widow. She's, you know, she's on, she's looking after her family. She's in the position, I suppose, you know, as the matriarch, she's not gonna put up with that sort of behavior. So she, it's a kind of warning as well there's always the wider community is in mind it's public honor is a public thing yeah so that kind of negotiation behind closed doors thing and and trying to resolve things peacefully it, it, you know I, it's less prevalent i'd guess it's less obvious Hey, any other questions or comments? Mark. I'm finding this all very interesting. I'm living in the American South uh, in North Carolina and uh, moved here over 20 years ago, but I've been, uh, had a few confrontations where I realized uh, that the honor and shame culture here is uh, something I should be more aware of. Um, that, that, and, and I've re read about studies where um, people are more likely to, to take strong offense. It, psychological studies, if there's a narrow hallway and a big football player, you know, is coming down and the subject has to, it brushes against them. And, and, and there's a different culture of that here, along with the culture of politeness that's expected, people opening the doors for one another. And so uh, the question I want to raise is, how this difference, which you've outlined and I've read about, heard about elsewhere too, between which I think is very helpful between the honor and shame culture and the dignity guilt culture, how they both have positive and negative aspects and, and both are ways of dealing with the problem, the freeloader problem in human societies, right? Where um, many of us try to um, 
obey rules in order for all to thrive or whatever community we see our group we see mm. to thrive. But then there's the possibility of some people taking advantage. So how are they dealt with? And is the, does the middle way offer a, a balance between the honor shame and dignity guilt with their positive and negative aspects? Mm. And I think that's a brilliant question. And, and I think that that, I think, um, I, I think it's, this is, this, I, what I would say is that, you know, I've, I think sometimes the, the dignity, guilt can be kind of a way of looking at things can be quite abstract. It can be quite cerebral that we, we think of things in, in terms of the justice system and the law and how that law is enforced. Whereas to me, uh, the honor system to, seems to be quite embodied. It's in a time and place. It's it's not. They're not. You know, they're not the same system all over the world. They're quite different. They show up in different ways. There'll be different rules, perhaps even from one village to the next. So they're very, very much in time and space, and to be decided by the people within that community. And I think. And, and I think that that offers us something really interesting to the middle way is, is you know, how do, how, and in fact, I can never remember his name, so I'll say it again. Yeah, Tamala Summers' book. He tries to think about those questions. He says, what are we throwing away if we throw away honour? The book's called um, Why Honour Matters. You know, why, where it matters. Obviously, we think in sport, in the army, we think it seems to be a good idea, but it's quite motivating for people to have this sense of community. As you said, and you said there's a thin skinnedness as well, which of course people said about Trump constantly. He's thin skinned um, because in dignity, there is a, there's a sense of, in which you, you're rising above that. You can take an insult, you're not offended. In the honor system, it's kind of, the opposite, the uh, the um, instance at Jarrett's buildings in near Barnsley that I was talking about, there again and again, women appear in court because they hear that that someone's been talking wrongly about them, that they've been shaming them in public. So they walk they walk across town and they punch someone for it. The women do. I mean that obviously that would is in a dignity culture that would be called thin skinned, and. And I guess, but obviously there's something very, very embodied <laughs> in that. So I, but I do think that there's a kind of negotiate, there's a very middle way process that we can employ here. And, and that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> How do we absolutely take the both? And they're not polar opposites, are they, these systems? But how can we take the values from both and recognize the shadow in both? as well yeah yeah I, I think what you and susan were bringing up uh, regarding individualism here in the state mm. or more interdependent sense of identity in other especially east asian cultures is an important mm. part of this too um mm. because there are you know there's positive and negative aspects to, to those different systems as well and yes. perhaps a better balancing each in, mm. in each community that, that could be done um, mm. So that you know, more individualist communities recognize interdependence and, and vice versa. And, mm. and one more issue, because you brought up Trump, it seems so ironic that he was attracted. I agree, this is a way to diagnose it. But it's so ironic that he was attractive to people in an honor and shame sense yes. because he's so shameless in yes. business dealings and you know, sex with uh, various women who are, and, and now he's in a lot of legal trouble that he put off while he was mm -hmm. president. And yet he's still very popular. It seems that there's some sort of um, strange defensiveness about a leader who seems to transcend uh, appeals to honor, an uh, honor and shame dynamic and yet transcends shamelessness. Yeah, yeah. And I think, in a sense, I think that Trump's been misrecognized by those communities. 
<laughs> because the, you know the the uh, Arthur Scargill, who is the tra the, new, the National Union of Miners um, leader, I mean he had his own problems actually with embezzling funds from the union. So he you know he wasn't a man that was above <laughs> kind of the kind of uh, corruption perhaps that Trump was, but he was a man that was from that community. You know, he left school when he was 15, he became a minor, and he rose to being an incredibly important political figure in 80s Britain, you know, the, the Britain of the 1980s. And um, whereas Trump is actually quite different to that, but somehow people recognize that in him. He re they recognize a familiar union leader, a Democrat leader, an old fashioned Democrat leader, they somehow recognize in Trump but I'm not sure that's what he is, but that's what he somehow, that's the performance he gives. Going back to the issue of, of reconciling two cultures, um, maybe I could toss out a, a, an idea and see what you think, Nina. Um, you mentioned Jonathan Haidt earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so what strikes me particularly here is that there are uh, Haidt's six values that he identifies in mm -hmm. social political attitudes could, could <clears throat> can very much be related to these um, different cultures. So yeah. you mentioned sanctity, but also loyalty and authority are often identified as the more conservative values with small c. Yeah. Um, yes, in these more traditional communities. Um, but then the, at least on one interpretation of them, as justice and freedom and care are the, the three values which you would identify much more or tend to find emphasize much more in the, in the politics of people who have uh, perhaps more urban, more educated, professional, whatever, yeah, so, so uh, are more likely to be liberal in their political sympathies. Um, and, but um, having said that, as Hype points out, those um, justice, freedom, care values are also valued by conservatives, but just in a slightly different way. So, mm. so justice, for example, is going to, they're going to emphasize, um, well, as you said at the beginning, the proportionality of justice and eye for an mm. eye, tooth for a tooth. Mm. Uh, and care is more care for your family or care for immediate people or friends or whatever, rather than care for immigrants yes. or, or whatever. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I think that, that that has been, an, unfortunately, a big misunderstanding about Brexit as well. That, that in um, the, no, this, this community that I'm talking about between Wakefield and Barnsley, they are the Red Wall. They are epitomised the Red Wall. That's what that's what they were. They were always Labour voters, and um, and obviously this time voted Conservative. Um, and the for them, in fact. Arthur Scargill made a speech about it in 2019, where he, you know, he made the left-wing case for Brexit, in, in uh, where he believed that it wasn't immigration that was driving wages down and, and zero hours contacts. He felt it was freedom of movement, and I don't know, you know, I, don't, I'm not sure that's a, a great argument, but he was, you know, he. He was very mistrustful of Europe. He was Eurosceptic, but because he felt he felt that there, this devastation of the traditional industry in Britain that had so damaged the communities he'd loved was somehow the result of um, of the EU, and he felt that there could be, you know, we could go back to being a, an industrially based nation under the European Union, uh, oh, sorry, post-Brexit, yeah. Yeah, so, so those, those kind of values of loyalty particularly. Yes. Loyalty coming out in the Brexit and thank you mm -hmm. coming out. Uh, yeah. I suppose a middle way approach to those values, as I've often talked about it, is, is recognising them all, you know, that we all yes. have all of them. Um, yes. They have to be kept in some sort of balance with each other. Um, yeah, yeah. Than just saying, Justice is what it's all about, and there are no other values, which is, is where you get. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think we've talked before, haven't we, about authority? That I uh, that it it's been very difficult for me to understand where my sense of authority, respect for authority, comes from. And in delving into this work, 
uh, obviously, you know, it is confused because, I, and I always, I always, I've always described myself as class confused. You know, I had a middle class father and a working class mother, and, and uh, the values of both have become quite confused in my mind. And I, but in the sense, the you know what my mother's community had, the the, the kind of respect for authority, is a respect for that kind of that for community, for family, for family authority, for the, um, for the right of the father to take moral responsibility for his family, for the right of the woman, for the wife, for the mother, to enforce the honour on the father, for, to, to, to enforce him into that honourable position. So that, you know, that's been very interesting for me, it's been recognised that definitely I have that respect for authority, which I always found difficult to place because it's about community and family. It's not out there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, perhaps we go to break into to group for a while, but we could come back for, for plenary uh, if we've got any other questions for me in a week. Okay. So we've just got, um, maybe not, not, not that long, but getting on for 10 minutes. Any uh, questions for Nina or any points you want to bring back to everyone? Um, Nina, I was interested in that if you look at um, traditional societies of honor and shame, it, it's, I mean, look at Japanese culture, but looking at contain cultures in a way like you were describing. But we're living in a very multicultural, well, there's crossover. So we were in our group talking a bit about, quite a lot about, we are in one group and suddenly we find ourselves swallowed up in another group, like Jim at school, or with the Quakers we, uh, is describing a situation um, a bit uh, like the JK Rowling one. Mm. Which we were, we just suddenly allowed a feminist group in, who obviously felt very strong, and the tr and there was someone trans in the, uh, the meeting house, and said, "This is absolutely awful. You cannot do that. Do you not realise what the feminists are doing?" It was, it was exactly that situation. But we innocently, or not me, but there's a Norwich actually. We, we get crossed over nowadays into different communities and we get bewildered and confused. Um, and I, I'm not sure how, uh, and we talked about that a bit as well at the end with, with Andrew, it's like we're, we're pulled in all these different directions as, what, as a middle way, how do we um, handle things like that? Mm -hmm. In a, in a sense, we're, we're at a disadvantage because we, it's this kind of amorphous culture that, uh, that people assume that we belong to as well. I mean, it, it, and I think in the, la in the last um, year or so, we, you know, they're, they're increasingly white people seem to be labelled as white as if they are a homogeneous group of people. And it's, and of course, if you come from a minority ethnic group, it's easier to say, actually, that's not my experience. So I come from a different group. But actually, my, well, I would say we all come from incredibly small groups. Uh, family situations, community situations that all inform us. And we don't have that, this, that kind of hope, um, communality of experience that we do. and I or, or that we're presented as having or that we just don't and and as you say we we can fit into different situations all the time definitely school does the strange thing where it teaches about kind of liberal western democracy and at the same time we're in teams where we're meant to be very loyal to the team or loyal to the school or bring honor on the school or you know it, that's quite confusing I think, um, where, but also completely accepted that that's what's happening, that, uh, that we're fitting into two systems all the time. And, and if we are aware, you know, and I think that there's great advantage of, of being kind of aware of that. And in fact, you know, that, that's 
uh, you know, through definitely the last 70 years, that's kind of what, if longer than that, maybe 90 years, anthropology has kind of done that. It said, actually, you know, if we look at all our cultures, we have these incredibly traditional parts and assumptions and what passes as common sense. What we think is common sense, isn't it? It's incredibly culturally informed, very regional. Um, so uh, it's really worth for all of us, I think, examining the cultures that we come from, what's informed us, what we've taken from our mothers, our fathers, our schools, um, the communities that we've been part of, what we've borrowed from um, people, you know, like the Jewish family down the road, or the, um, the Hong, Kong, Hong Kong East family across the street, what we've, what we've absorbed, what we've reflected on, what we've found. Um, because I think that, you know, going forward, that's going to be incredibly helpful to us. Because, be, you know, people assuming stuff about us <laughs> can be very, very confusing. And I think it's very helpful if we own what we are what our values are in, in terms of liberal democracy, but what are perhaps the traditional values that we hold are as well. Thanks, Nina. <laughs> that wasn't too garbled. <laughs> Thanks, so we've got time maybe for one more question or point from somebody? Well, something just quickly, something came up in our group that I'm, I'm not sure you, you mentioned, Nina, but that the, the, when we're considering politics in the US, and maybe it happens in the UK too, there's this rural versus urban divide. And the rural seems to have more of the honor shame, whereas the college educated or urbanized um, might often think more in the direction of uh, dignity and guilt. Is, is that part of the dynamic that that you've noticed too? Yeah, I think so. The um, we have got a slightly actually, I think there's probably a huge similarities in the US because we also have this um, uh, you know kind of industrial towns that have shrunk. Uh, so they had very particular kind of working class cultures of their own, which were very honor based, uh, which is, you know, kind of what I was describing with my own family history between these two northern towns of Wakefield and Barnsley, where this kind of shrinkage um, has happened because people can no longer get jobs in those areas. And they have gone to the bigger cities like Leeds, London, uh, Manchester, Birmingham, and definitely in those urban centres, there is a, a different, um, a different experience of identity and uh, and individualism as well. Yeah. And I I'm just speaking personally now that where I try to find a middle way balance through my understanding of Buddhism, but also modern psychology is the problem of ego, right? So I think on either side of that anthropological distinction, there's a problem of ego. I could, I could feel that, you know, I'm very dignified, uh, even though I have some guilt, and other people should be also, or I can feel a sense of my honor violated if I take offense and for some small thing. And either, either way, it could be my, my hollow ego, you know, inflated, which we see a lot in certain political leaders like Trump. And, 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 and the middle way, for me anyway, involves a questioning of my own ego and my ego identification. Is, yeah. is that, do you see that kind of psychological also involved? Yeah, absolutely. And it, uh, yeah, what you, I think, I, I think it's quite interesting to reflect on the beginnings of both Buddhism and Christianity. Um, we seem to see in the Bible passages where Jesus is saying, don't insult anyone, it'll lead to murder. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, insulting someone is really bad because it's going to escalate. And uh, so it's not the words themselves that are bad, but just don't do it. And then obviously you've got this situation where the Buddha comes from, uh, you know, the, a warrior class. 
Um, I'm, I'm not very good on the um, suitors and where things appear, but apparently you know, when he went back to his clan, most of them have been wiped out. So there, there is a sense in which these religions have perhaps grown out or their philosophy has grown out of a reaction against an honor culture to some extent. But as you say, what has grown and what is being denied in rejecting that wholesale. Yeah, that, that fits in nicely with, with the early life of the Buddha, doesn't it? And the, the um, dad of the Buddha going forth from an honor culture, but then he goes into the more universalizing culture of the forest, the, the forest renunciants. Um, but he also has to get beyond the limitations of that and see the, the uh, mm. make the connections again with, with some aspects of his roots. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely, that's that's the journey I've been on, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Great. Right. That leaks, leaks nicely with the the talk I'm going to be giving on the second of May, which is all about that uh, that early life of the Buddha. Great. Good. Okay.